Hi everyone, so welcome back to the channel. My name is Caroline. I'm a lecturer in physics at a UK university. Thank you for all the nice comments that have started appearing underneath the videos. It's lovely to know that people are watching the videos and I'm starting to discuss some of the topics that you're interested in. Um, so last week we discussed how you go from being a lecturer to a professor. Right now I'm a lecturer. Maybe one day if I keep working hard I'll rise through the academic ranks and I'll become a professor. But if you're interested in that journey and how a UK university has academic rankings for their, their staff, um, I'll include a link to last week's video up here. But this week, I thought we could start by looking actually at the piece of the puzzle before. So how do you go from being a college student or studying for your A-levels all the way through to becoming a lecturer? Um, so let's do that bit of the academic journey today. So most of us will have done some form of college education. I, I don't know what you've done. Maybe you've done a BTEC, you might have done an access course, you could have done an IB, a diploma. Um, many, I suspect, will have done A-levels. But usually that is your entry qualification into a university. Um, so I'm an admissions tutor, so I'm responsible for looking at all these entry qualifications and setting the entry requirements for our university physics course. And I work with the head of department and then we look at the intake coming into the course each year. Um, but yeah, so you, you'll have your A-levels or your diploma and then usually students will pick to do a undergraduate bachelor's course or an undergraduate integrated master's course. Uh, the bachelor's program that is usually a three-year degree sometimes it can be four years if you put in a placement or a professional training experience or year if you're doing integrated masters usually they are four years so the difference between them a bachelor's you're going to qualify with a bse so a bachelor's degree and if you're doing the integrated masters um, in my case for my course you are going to get an mphys so a master of physics and you don't actually graduate before you get that MPhys. So you go all the way through and you get the masters actually as your first graduation. And there is another route. So you can do the bachelor's course. So a three year bachelor program and then do a one year or maybe two year if you do it part time standalone master's course. So it's called an MSI um, and it can be taught research or a mix of both. And the advantage of that route is you can change university. So you can do your bachelor's program at one university, and then you can go and do your master's program at a different university if you want. And it also means you can specialize. So you can have a general bachelor in physics, but then go and do your MSc in a particular topic or a focused area of physics. The integrated master's, so that's the one where you go all the way through, that has the benefit that your course is already organized for you. Um, often the course will have um, specialist modules that you can take, so you can still choose to, choose to specialise if you want to. And in the case of my university, you actually have a research year as part of your integrated masters, which is an amazing opportunity. You can travel to a world leading international lab, or you can stay actually at the university that I'm based in, and you do 11 months of research and you write a short dissertation at the end of it. And it's such a good taste of what it would be like to do a PhD or to be a research scientist. But typically you're going to go to university as a student and you're going to do some form of degree course in physics, be that a bachelor's one, an integrated master's one, or a bachelor's with a standalone MSc at the end. And then from there, if you're looking to stay within academia, you then need to go on and do a PhD. So this is a lot of years now at university. So you'll have spent three or four years studying for your first degree and you get awarded it. And then you're looking at another three to four years to get your PhD. And your PhD can be at a different university to where you studied for your first degree. Some students change universities, some students don't change universities. There's a big difference between doing an undergraduate degree program and a PhD program. Uh, the PhD program, you are focusing on an area of research that's exclusively yours, if you like. You have to make a novel contribution to your research community. You work very closely with your supervisor and it's a very focused piece of study for three, three and a half years, giving you a big thesis usually at the end and an oral exam. So typically you're going to have a viva and that viva at the end of your PhD can last anywhere between two to four hours. So it's a long exam at the end um, and really your examiners are looking to see if the PhD is making a novel contribution. You know, are you making a novel contribution to the research community? Has the work been your work um, and have you shared and disseminated your findings where appropriate? So that's the journey so far. You've gone undergraduate degree programme, so bachelor's, 
masters, integrated masters, standalone masters, and then you've moved into doing a PhD. And just a reminder, we're talking about how you would go through if you were looking to have some kind of lectureship position. Obviously, you can leave after your first degree, you can go on to many good graduate schemes, you can get a job, you can start your own company. We can discuss all of that good stuff in another video. Right now, we're focusing on how would you get through to being a lecturer. So you've gone from first degree, you've completed your PhD, what happens at the end of your PhD? So I just glossed through about seven to eight years worth of work it's taken so far to get you to the end of your PhD. Now, this is where my career path was a bit different to many students. I actually left academia after my PhD. I'd really enjoyed my time, but I actually wanted to go and try and experience the world of industry. So I left with my PhD and I joined a company and I worked in a company and I worked in different parts of the organisation and I acquired new research-based physics skills and managerial skills and leadership skills working for that company. And then I came back to academia. But more commonly, people who want to ultimately be a lecturer will choose to stay within academia and they'll go from their PhD into something called a postdoc. So a postdoctoral researcher. And that is like a stepping stone, I guess, between being a student and becoming an academic member of staff of the department. Because as a postdoc, you are responsible for your own research, but you're aligned to a research team. So there will be a supervisor in the group and the supervisor will be looking after the PhD students. And the supervisor is technically, I guess, your line manager, if you like. You're kind of the person that you would report into your research. And ideally, you want your postdoc to have research that complements the supervisor or the lead academic in the group that you've joined. But it's really important as a postdoc that your research is also forming its own flavour. It's becoming novel and distinctive in its own rights, because at some point you've got to sever the connection between yourself and the supervisor who's leading the research group to which you're affiliated, because that's when you transition to becoming a lecturer in your own right. And to do that, you need to have a, an identity, a thing, an area, um, some bit of science that you become known for in the community. So a postdoc typically will last between one, two or three years. Um, it's quite common that if you've done your undergraduate and your PhD at the same university, it's really advisable to change at that point and go to a different university to do your postdoc. Just so you get more experience, you know, research groups will operate in slightly different ways. We do things slightly differently. Um, university structures may be similar, but there will be differences between different organisations. You might have been working on a campus-based university and you want to experience a college-based university or vice versa. Um, and what's also very useful and an asset to your CV is if you choose to do your postdoc at an international university. So you actually leave the country that you did your first part of studying and go and experience university life in a different country. And most people will do one to two postdocs before thinking about applying for a lectureship. So as a quick recap, we've gone college days, A-levels, diplomas, BTECs. Then we've got into the university. You've done your bachelor's undergraduate program or you've done an integrated master's program. You may or may not have done a standalone master's after that. Then you go off and do your PhD, three to four years of really interesting, novel, cutting edge work where you start to find your own research topic and area and explore an idea on your own with your supervisor supporting you. Finish your PhD, so you've graduated maybe once after your bachelor's, maybe twice if you did a bachelor's and a standalone master's, then you graduate again with your PhD. So you could have graduated three times by this point when you've got your PhD. Then when you've got your PhD, most cases, if you're looking to become a lecturer, people will go on and do a postdoc, so a postdoctoral research position, lasting anywhere between one or three years. Um, and then it's very typical that people will go and do a second postdoctoral research position after that. So another one to three years. And at that point, that's when people usually have enough publications behind them, enough research experience. They've had experience of different labs. They've had working different conditions, working on different techniques, using different methods. Usually you've had some experience of teaching. So the PhD phase of your career, you'll be most likely be supervising kind of the undergraduate students and assisting with the courses and doing some marking and lab demonstrating. And then when you're a postdoctoral researcher, you're looking after the PhD students and making sure that they're staying on track with their research and supporting them. 
And by the time you've finished two, one or two postdocs, you've then got this kind of research experience behind you, the teaching experience behind you, and then you're ready to go on and start looking to apply for lectureships. So it's quite a long journey, you know, three to four years on your undergraduate degree, another three to four years on your PhD, so that's seven to eight years, another three to six years on your postdoc, so what that's, that's three, six, nine, nine to 12 years probably. So yeah, it's quite a long time between starting your degree and getting to the place where you have enough experience and expertise to go for your lectureship. But don't be disheartened if it takes longer because it's very typical that it takes longer to get enough experience to make it to where you need to be to be able to apply for those lectureship positions. And then of course you're into the university scheme and the one I discussed in the last video. But as I said, I didn't do that. I actually opted to leave academia at the end of my PhD and so I didn't postdoc. So I, I left academia, I went into industry um, and I got experience and leadership and skills in industry which meant that I didn't need to do the postdocs because I'd got experience elsewhere and so I could kind of miss the postdoc stage and then come in at the lectureship stage. But I hope that helps explain a little bit about the journey. No two journeys will necessarily be the same and um, there'll be different ways you could do it. Maybe you've done a foundation year before entering your bachelor's programme. Maybe you elected to do an integrated master's and you're then putting a standalone master's afterwards because you want to specialise. Maybe you started your PhD and it wasn't going quite how you wanted and so you had to change topic so you then had to kind of restart your PhD. Maybe you took a career break, you did one postdoc, then you wanted to go into work into industry then you came back, maybe you did another postdoc and then you applied to be a lecturer. You know, there's no necessary one path through this whole journey, but roughly that's how you go from being a college student to being in a position to apply for a lectureship. Whew. I hope that was useful um, and vaguely interesting. Uh, at some point, we should probably have the discussion about how you choose your university. I'm aware that right now, if you're watching this and it's summer, um, summer 2020 in the UK. If you're watching it right now, UCAS, which are the organisation that we use in the UK to kind of organise people's applications to university, their closing deadline for students to pick their top two universities is actually mid-June. So our UK students have to decide which is their first choice university and their second choice university on the application. And so on Thursday, I'll pop up a video about how to choose the right university for your undergraduate degree course. But thank you for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. Please do leave me comments um, below if there's things you would like me to talk about. I've got a huge long list of university stuff I can chat away about, but if there's something in particular you're, you're interested in or you're wondering about, let me know. Give the video a like and a subscribe. That really helps because it means that YouTube does something with this algorithm and other students will get to see it. And if you've got any experience about how you went from your start point in your career to where you are right now, do put them in the comments because what you're doing might help somebody else who's thinking about going down the same career path. But thanks for watching, have a great week, I'll see you in a few days on Thursday, take care and I'll see you then, bye!